Um, so again, these are sort of fundamental properties that are not trivial to determine just by staring at a piece of, of a text. And you can imagine when you're starting to do your code review, one of the first questions you might ask is, well, where's all the dynamic memory being allocated in this system? Because that really matters to our analysis. OK, so if we're going to, we've got these inputs and these outputs. Now we want to say a little bit more about them. Great, well, you got some input. But are there any requirements on those inputs? Are there any preconditions? If you violate those preconditions, then you know, there's no promise this algorithm is going to work. Do we know what the preconditions are? Do they match the requirements? Have you written an algorithm that is great if you give it numbers under 100,000, but as soon as they get over 100,000, things start overflowing, you're doing multiplications, and you know, so forth and so on. Uh, you'd like to really know whether this algorithm actually can meet the requirements that it has for it. Post conditions, what are the effects on the output? Can we say anything about the characterizes the outputs of this algorithm in terms of ranges and so on? So if we go back to our function random, uh, the static analyzer can actually extract out of the code, again, some of these properties. For example, it can extract that the input, the seed has to be in this range. There are certain assumptions made in, apparently in the algorithm that that's the range that it's expecting. For example, maybe there's a constraint check in ADA, or there may be other reasons why this is the only range of inputs that it can handle. You give it something outside of that, and it may, uh, it, it may fail. So what about the outputs? Can we say anything about the value of the seed after this function? Well, it turns out it's the incoming seed, seed tick old, times some you know, appropriate random uh, prime number plus some other appropriate random prime number, uh, mod 2 to the 16th. This is all extracted out of the code itself by looking at the algorithm and uh, knowing a certain amount about how the mod operator works. Of course, we remember that from Algebra 2 or something, wasn't it? Somewhere in that zone. That probably promises us that the result is going to be in the range 0 to 2 to 16th minus 1, which is comforting because that was one of the input requirements. And so we now know that we can call random more than once, and it won't die after the third time because of the precondition being violated. So that's a, that's a good, good sign. Um, and can we say anything about the actual result it returns? Well, it turns out uh, it, it's maintaining a 16-bit seed, but it's returning a 15-bit value for whatever reason. That's the way this was designed. So the result it actually is returning is the seed value modulo 2 to the 15th. And what can we say about that range? Well, again, algebra 2 comes in handy here, 2 to the 0 to 2 15th minus 1. So these are all things that a, a static analyzer can determine by studying the code. And then a human reviewer can come along and say, oh, well, that's very interesting. That doesn't match what the requirements were at all. You know? Or actually, that's great. Or it's, it, it supersedes the requirements. It, you know, it, it handles larger numbers, it blah, 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 whatever. But if you're going to start reviewing a piece of code, it's nice to know whether you're fundamentally got the right starting point. And uh, this is a one kind of thing you want to do. If there are any questions, just, you know. Okay. 25173 is not prime. Well, I didn't rank up this. This was, this was a random number generator that was well, it, officially it, called it generated random. generated a random number. You said it was prime. Sorry. Oh, you're welcome. A random odd number. How's that? <laughs> Thank you, John. I'm glad there was someone in the audience was listening and carefully analyzing the... Uh, Divides by nine. This, this random number generator is actually called cheap random. And I, I found it out of a... Uh, <laughs> So there, there you go. That's something that a good reviewer would have caught right like that, you know? So what are you using a non-prime number for there? I'm sure it's more, well, it's, oh, it's got to be just mutually prime, right? It's all we care about, right? <laughs> right, right. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Any other questions? <coughs> OK. So uh, looking at the pre and post conditions can be interesting in and of itself, as John proved here. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This was actually in some customer code or actually, I guess this is in a potential customer code. And they refused to believe this was a bug. Look at this. This thing is called days in month. And here's the post condition. The result, we determined by analyzing it, it's one of these values, 0, 31, 59, 91, blah, blah, blah. And they refused to believe that was a bug. They said, well, that must have been what it was supposed to do. OK, well, OK, why did you call it days and months? Well, you know, historical accident or something. And I don't think so. But um, it's pretty clear when you look at what they're trying to do is they want to do a 
to calculate how many days in a month, you subtract the, you know, the how many days at the end of the month minus how many days at the beginning of the month, and you know how long it is. So this was a table set up to do you know, calculations of dates, and they were using it improperly. And, and this, this post condition kind of screams to me like somebody's really confused. Uh, so that was interesting. And, and a lot of post conditions you know, are pretty boring. Well, yeah, OK, of course, two to the, you know, zero, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes they just jump out at you like, that's really weird. Uh, another thing that we do in our tool is after we had been using this for a while, we, uh, we began to notice certain preconditions that were weird. Like you'd see a uh, precondition and say, well, the input has to be 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6 on up to like infinity. What happened to 2? Two? 2's a good input. You know, why not 2? And so when you see preconditions that have gaps in them, that, that's like really weird. Turns out it was one of these things where someone had obviously done a little bit of maintenance on the program but hadn't quite changed one of the tests. And if it was more than, uh, if it was less than two inputs, then it would give you an error message. If it was, but then it would actually use three of the inputs as uh, values in its calculation. So apparently they'd added a third parameter and not actually checked for it. Anyway, that's a typical kind of thing that, that you can find. Okay, um, this is supposed to be the uh, uh, radio astronomy going on here. What happens if you're calling code that you can't analyze? That's, a, that's definitely a challenge for some of these tools because, okay, we only have so much code. We're not going to analyze every line in the entire world every time we do this tool. There may be third-party libraries. There may be code written in machine code, I mean, in assembly language or in another language or just, just not available. It hasn't been written yet. So how do you analyze that? If you're trying to do code review pretty early in the process, how can you use a tool that's sort of a bottom-up type analysis? Well, uh, one of the ways to, to deal with this is simply for the tool to admit, OK, I didn't analyze that call on line six. So here we have a function called DOS get immediate. DOS is one of those old-fashioned operating systems that used to exist. And this is getting a character and not waiting for somebody to hit character turn or something. And how does it get it? Well, it calls some special BIOS function. Well, we don't happen to have the ADA source code for the BIOS function, surprisingly enough. Um, but we can say that on line six, you're making a call on some unanalyzed code. And that's actually interesting in and of itself. That is, uh, we propagate that information also up to a fairly high level. So if you've got a thing that's supposed to just be doing a calculation, but it also says, oh, by the way, it calls the operating system, or it calls some database, or it makes some network. First of all, that may be like, why is it doing that? It's not supposed to be talking across the network. Uh, we had a customer who, who was quite interested in this because they have people who they don't fully trust doing some of their software development. They, you know, they outsource it to some third party and then they outsource it to some other place and so on. And then the software comes back and they, should they install it on their website as the official, uh, you know, banking interface or something for their system. And if they find something that's supposed to be telling you the balance of your bank account and actually it's going out there and fiddling with databases and so on, and doing some updates and various other things, you might begin to think, hmm, is this really what I want to do? So it's, it's, in and of itself, it's interesting to know what kind of external calls are being made. And finally, are you making any assumptions about the data coming back? Again, the, the analyzer can look at how those results are used. So you go off, you call some totally unknown thing, and then you just blindly assume it's in certain range. For example, you assume it's not null, or you assume it fits in an 8-bit value, or something like that. Or you read some sensor, and uh, you're just making the assumption that that sensor is delivering you a value in some range. You're going to want to look at some of those assumptions. Does that match what the hardware is doing, or does that match what the operating system is doing? That sort of assumption. Or are you opening yourself up for a dangerous situation where in one case, you know, maybe, maybe it returns a 16-bit Unicode value or something, and uh, you know, that's going to definitely foul up this algorithm.